All right, Lakshmi, I've been looking forward to doing this with you for some time now. So thank you so much. I want to start by uh, asking you about joy. What do you notice brings you joy? I love teaching, especially to children, teaching them Hatha yoga classes. Yesterday was a, a great example of that. Um, I've been teaching this kid since she was one years old and, and uh, she was chanting after the yoga class as she was rolling up her mat and she was going, may the entire universe be filled with peace and joy, love and light. And it, it made me so happy and made me think, wow, if every child on the planet was learning prayers like this from such a young age, what a different world the place would be. And it made me so happy to hear a kid not just going, oh, mom, I'm going to my yoga class and, you know, I don't want to do it. She was like so happy. And so for me, it's such a great gift to be able to share um, the teachings of yoga with kids and the fact that they, I, I like, they like me. <laughs> so what do you think's behind that? Like, why does that bring you joy? seeing her happiness? I think it's a, a natural thing. It's, it, it's like anything. When, when we make someone else happy, it makes ourselves happy. It's, it's the same with karma yoga. It's like not that it's an intentional thing that we should be doing, but automatically when we're helping others or serving others, you see the repercussions of that, and that automatically makes you feel more joy inside of yourself. Like for me, right. one of the best ways... A feeling joy is really the practice of karma yoga. So like, uh, you know, Swami Satchidananda's quote, who will be the happiest person, the one who brings happiness to others. So mm -hmm. do you believe that? Is, and do you think that's true for everyone? I don't know if it's true for everybody. I think it depends on the attitudes of, of your personality. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily true. I don't know for everybody. But all I know is that, we all have to find that thing in life, which is what we're passionate about, not pretending like I'm Swami Satchitananda or any other Swami or any other great teacher, that authenticity in me and going, this is what I love doing. This is what makes me happy. And this is how this makes me happy through whether it's serving the local community or working with ch children with special needs, whatever it is. But finding that inside of you is, uh, you know, for me, that's, what brings me the highest joy, you know, it used to be partying and, you know, taking <laughs> drugs and alcohol. Um, and now I, I think feeling useful brings joy. I think being useful, you know, Swami Satchinanda, you know, said the, the goal of integral yoga and sort of like we want to live an easeful, peaceful and useful life. I think the sense of feeling useful brings great joy to me. I've also learned that, you know, being too useful at times and being too helpful at times. Also, um, we need to set boundaries. But, uh, you know, for, for making me feel joy, a majority of the time, it would be by feeling useful and serving others. Right. Yeah, it's, that's a good point. I think that you met uh, that you made is overextending myself, the danger of that or not having the boundaries. So it's it's being useful, but maybe the combination is there a freedom, yeah. you know, that I have that I'm not pressuring myself to be useful. That it's, that it is coming from a place of, of joy and, and desire. And there's a really fine line there. Right. Oh my goodness. I've had a journey of, yeah, over 20 years of kind of just going, Oh yeah, I really want, to, this is what makes me happy. And then suddenly being the grumpiest person and complaining about everybody and everything. And oh, I'm doing this all by myself and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, finding that balance and that self-care. You know, for a lot of my time on, uh, since coming into yoga, I've overextended myself um, because wanting to feel useful, wanting to be seen, wanting to be recognized, acknowledged, because of conditioning from childhood of like, you're not good enough or, you know, at school, you're, I wasn't academic. So always trying to prove myself. And I ended up going down sort of like a rabbit hole of misery because I overextended and then realized that I wasn't getting any joy out of any of it. So to find that, that, that self-care and authenticity of why am I doing this? Am I doing this for a selfish 
purpose to get attention, which I was for a long, a, a, a long time. And now I feel like I do things just for doing it, just for me. It's not for uh, acknowledgement from anyone else. It makes me feel good. You mentioned something there about like wanting to prove something to, to others or, or myself. I'm curious, like, is that, um, does that like kind of fly in the face of self-care itself? Like if I need to prove something, you know, does that mean that I'm not accepting myself wholly, uh, you know, just being totally whole and complete the way that I am, um, that something is deficient. And if I'm doing that, is that, that's not self-care, is it? No. <laughs> yeah, it, it's such an, this idea of, um, needing to get approval, which I feel is one of my patterns in this journey, is really challenging to, you know, realize what is self-care, what is self-love. And I feel like I'm just beginning to uh, begin to skim the surface of how that actually feels, which is a very different feeling from trying to get acknowledgement from somebody else, which isn't really self-care, but it's a way of us sort of like lifting ourselves up. It's a way of us fueling ourselves by someone praising us, like at school when we used to get a little gold star. Or I think it's conditioning mm. from, from very early on. I think so too. So it's like reconditioning or training myself. Yeah. Because it's so tricky. It's like I've counted on this external force to validate myself for so long. So I'm in the habit of doing that. It's like the little pleasure hits of like, Oh yeah, good job. Good boy. You know, all of that. And that I, I, I count on that. You know, I even noticed it the other day, I'll share a little, little situation. I was, I was visiting with um, my niece who is only a few weeks old and I was holding her and carrying her around the house and she was so content, you know, and I just felt like, you know, I was doing a good job, you know, being with her, caring for her, trying to radiate love, like all of, all of that. I'm sitting with her feeling really good and content. And then I noticed that my mind, I really wanted someone else to come into the room and say, oh, wow, look how happy the baby is. Look how good you're doing. And I, I noticed that. Yeah. Like, oh, that's, that's still there. Whoa. What is that? And I saw how strong that pull was to want to be validated by an external force. It's unbelievable. I think we've been conditioned from so early on to yes, no, good, bad. That I, I love what Swami Satchananda said, you know, when people asked him what he was and he said, I'm not a Hindu, I'm an undo. And I feel like everything on this journey is to undo everything that I've learned. Um, <laughs> it's really, it, it's really, really tough. And we're always sort of seeking this little approval from from somebody else and it's nice but it shouldn't be the reason uh, why we're doing it yeah there's something there's something deeper than that it feels like that's like surface level and maybe this is really what the the path of of yoga is about i mean is it ultimately about realizing that i'm a part of nature that in a way, I'm a part of this. The way that I put it is uh, part of the divine creation. Mm -hmm. right? I'm not better or worse than anyone else, but I'm, I'm whole. It's like this sense of, of wholeness. When I really feel that, then either the, you know, the praise or the blame, it's just, it's not that important anymore. It's not a priority. Absolutely. None of it's important. <laughs> You know, we're all just a collective living in this universe and working together. But how we separate ourselves is is a lot to do with, uh, you know, why we suffer. Right. And you mentioned the untangling mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of, of undoing. Mm -hmm. um, what is it? What the impressions of society that, that they put, and obviously there's got to be good stuff in there too. It can't only be negative impressions that, that we've experienced since, since childhood, but it does seem that like, oh, for, sometimes I'm overwhelmed by 
you know, how silly <laughs> our society is in, in a lot of ways with the things that we do. And it does, it feels like there's just so much work to do to get back to a state of, of cleanliness, uh, being, you know, untangled to really feel that, that, that sense of undoing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Now, first of all, I think we're really grateful to, to live in the part of the world that we do. You know, we, we don't have so many problems in life. I mean, problems are all relative, but, you know, what's really coming up for me at the moment is with this situation in Russia and Ukraine, it's, it's become the big thing on, on the media. And as devastating as all this is, you know, one of the reasons it's affecting is it's affecting the West. But there's things that have been going on in the Middle East that aren't acknowledged and are more barbaric. And I often think, God, if I was a person that was living, you know, in a refugee camp, would I be, you know, what would my mind be thinking? You know, we're so blessed to be where we are, um, that we have the opportunity to reflect and look at ourselves in the way that we are and to do this inner work. I can't imagine what it's like living in some parts of the world, especially as a woman, you know, that don't have their freedom. So I'm grateful at the moment, like every day, for the freedom that, that we have in the West um, and the opportunity to go on this journey of like understanding the minds and this undoing and being learning to be gentle towards myself and have compassion towards myself and go, do you know what, Lucy? You've done a really good job. You didn't react the same old way as you used to. You've done better. Good job, you know? And like I'm really working with myself with that at the moment is acknowledging these small little changes inside of me and just going, well done. Don't need approval from anybody else. Just go, I didn't give as much negative energy to that situation as before. Good job. Mm -hmm. Do you find that that positive reinforcement is is effective? Fully. Yeah. I'm really happy. You know, it, even if it's that I've been really challenged by, let's say, one of my sisters or whatever, and and before I would give it, let's, I'll be dramatic, maybe a week where I would talk about it and be like, oh, they really pissed me off or this or that. or, And then suddenly I'm like, I've only allowed an hour to be angry about that. And whereas before I would fuel that and keep talking about it for so long and keep reigniting that story, which ended up sort of fueling me in a negative way, but it was like giving me energy. And I was like, what is this all about? You know, where am I getting my energy from? It's a negative energy that I'm pulling from reliving this story. And now I'm going, okay, do you know what? You're allowed to give yourself an hour or two hours, or half a day, or 20 minutes, whatever it is. And I'm really proud if I manage to do that. And I go, well done. Are you finding benefit? Like what I hear and what you're saying is kind of this relationship with yourself. You're almost seeing yourself through the lens of a third person. There's, yeah. like, two, there's like two of you, like you're looking at, at Lucy. And I'm really interested in this because I've been playing with it for, for a while. It's like the me that's talking right now, I can consider it. I am Avi's safekeeper in a way for back of a, lack of a better word. And you are Lucy's safekeeper. So it's like, how do you take care of you? How do I take care of me? And if we all looked at ourselves through this way, like what kind of a world would it, would we live in? I think it's so practical, right? It's like, I think that so much suffering is experienced um, from wanting to change other people, but having no control over them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So like how I've decided to like cope with that is like fully focus on what I do control most intimately, which is me. And then do kind of what you're saying where it's like, you know, can I positively reinforce Avi? I really look at it like I'm training myself and that's where like where the yoga comes in too. Like, I don't know. How does that land with you? Like, do you, do you feel okay with using like that word? Do you see yourself like it's your job to train yourself or is that like an unpleasant notion? Yeah, I often look at, <laughs> at my life through like a computer game of like having a, a, a certain amount of lives and, you know, kind of just <laughs> getting like bonus points, you know, going, oh, good job. You know, I'm sort of like storing up the lucky coins or whatever. Um, 
because it just feels like that we're given so many opportunities and sometimes you know we hit rock bottom and I just think oh my god game over okay we've got to start again but each time we start a game again or we start over when we've hit rock bottom we've learned something new and we don't make the same mistakes again I mean and there's some things in life that I'm just going how have I managed to attract that again I wasn't trying and you'll meet someone where it's just like sandpaper where you just go ah I really thought I was doing well and now this person's here to teach me the same lesson that you're just not getting you know and I and I find that unbelievable that you know people keep coming to teach us what we're not getting you know there's a guy called David Wilcock and he he says we keep you know repeating the same patterns until we realize they're not useful to us anymore and and I and I feel like oh I'm doing really well and then boom you know and uh, and the lesson starts all over again but each time I feel that there's a little bit of I don't want to say progress <laughs> but more awareness more awareness of the situation why not pro- progress? I, I, d- I don't know if progress equals maybe ego, like I'm, I'm evolving, I'm, I'm becoming better. It, it just feels like I'm, I'm more peaceful in where I am. I'm more aware in where I am. And maybe progress is, is okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, it feels natural to me. I usually use the word growth, but it, it feels yeah. like, that is essential to what what we're here to do is simply to grow. Mm-hmm. It's just like a tree grows, right? Like what you're talking about, and then the the elements, the external factors are presenting themselves as opportunities for us to learn and grow and and evolve. I don't know if that to me, like the ego, the dangerous part of that is if I start comparing myself to to others, but I don't need to be interested in that game at all. Like that's, that's too complicated for me to figure out anyway, like how I compare to another human, like you can't put this stuff on the spreadsheets. Like, and you have no idea what's going on in someone else. And so it's like, I'm not interested in that. What I am interested in is the feeling of progress and growth just within yeah. myself. And just for the sake of it, also knowing that it's never ending. Like there's, there's, it, there's uh, never an end to growth. No, it's never ending it. You know, and, where I am right now is I'm okay with who I am and how my mind is judgmental and, and all, all, the, all the things that let's say good and bad, but none of them are good or bad. It's just, it is me. This is who I am and that's okay. You know, I think for so long I was trying so hard to be yogic and be so you know, peaceful. Now I'm just trying to be as honest and authentic as mm. I possibly can with, with my mind and saying where I am. Yeah. You were talking about that before, kind of how the understanding of let's say a spiritual path and what it means changes over time. Is that what you're referring to a little bit? Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, what your personal experience is and also maybe what you observe happening for other people as well as the journey changes. Yeah. At, at, at the beginning you know, I mean, integral yoga changed my life. And I, you know, was on a very uh, different path. And thanks to Swami Sharadananda, I got pulled into doing a teacher training. And my life went from taking a lot of drugs to and drinking and to a very extreme opposite of doing none of that for a very long period of time. And in, in, for that period of time where I had been so extreme, I needed that opposite extreme of having a very serious meditation practice. And, you know, I followed the book and I was like, okay, I have to shower every morning and I have to put on my white clothes to meditate. And I had this whole, um, you know, sort of did a whole puja and it was a whole two hour practice. And that's what I needed at, at the time. And now I feel like I'm in a, in a very, very different place. Um, and it feels hypocritical to meditate for an hour or half an hour, whatever anyone's practice is a day, and then be going out there and shouting or being angry or being judgmental of people. So now my practice is very much being aware all the time and seeing 
how I respond and react to things. And that for me is a much more beneficial practice right now. And it's like, I would have never imagined that. I remember a few teachers saying to me, this is where they were in their practice some years ago. And I was like, oh, they're cheating. Then they don't want to sit and do a formal practice anymore. This is just a reason. I think there's so much importance in having a seated practice. And I do have that as a part of my practice. But I thought, what's the point in doing any of this if I'm going to be, you know, nasty and grumpy and shouting and judgmental when I'm out in the real world? So to find that that equanimity in day-to-day life and that sort of mindfulness that the Buddhist practice brings in, I feel is a very important practice because so often I just think, where am I? I'm not present. What am I? I'm driving and I'm thinking of something else. So come back to the present, come back to the present. And, and I feel that this is sort of where I am with the, with the practices right now. It's not being so rigid as I was at the beginning. And now I'm a lot more moderate, have a glass of wine now and again. And it, whereas before it was possibly like a need, now it's just something that I go, oh, I enjoy a glass of wine now and again. It's not something that um, I'm needing as a tool to relax. It's just something that's a joy in life and I'm going to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And so I feel my attitudes change, whereas before I was like, oh, anyone that drank alcohol was like, not spiritual and all of this and how can you do this and the yogic path is this and you must be vegetarian and you must be this and you must be that and I was so I was so structured and judgmental and like I feel that that's all softened now a lot and I was with a yoga teacher recently and she'd been traveling around as pre-covid and she'd been traveling around the world and I was so jealous of her because she was telling me about how whatever tradition that she was with, whatever culture, she was enjoying their food. And I was like, oh, I have no desire to eat any meat or anything. But it would be so nice to be able to fit in with tribes and cultures and enjoy what they enjoy. But that's not where I'm at. But I just thought, wow, she's so free of, you know, this rigidity that what's what's right and what's wrong, you know. The Buddha, a lot of the Buddhists eat eat meat and all of these things. And I was I was so stuck for so long, even though I'm still stuck on being vegetarian. But it's okay. I, I'm not going to judge someone else for eating something in front of me. Whereas before, I was I felt like I was a bit like more superior by what I was doing was more superior than someone that wasn't on that path. And now I feel like a lot of these people are more superior to me like they're just so relaxed about life and I'm so sort of like "Mm, it's not like this and it's not like this you know it's like um once I was teaching yoga nidra and I taught it a different way to how it was taught in the manual and someone came up to me after the class and said you know I really couldn't fully relax because you didn't do the body scan and I was sort of like blown away with this and I was like why not? But And sometimes we become so sort of stuck in, in, in a format that we don't know how to just accept whatever comes. And I think, you know, life throws, you know, it's not like, you know, we're being told what life's going to throw us, you know, like, oh, we're going to be given a challenge tomorrow. Or we're going to be given. We don't know. So it's good to be able to accept everything that comes our way, including a yoga nidra that's slightly different but you know it was interesting because I was like huh that and now I'm teaching intermediate teacher training in in Gibraltar and you know they're having to let go of this rigidity of basic TT and how they've learned and learning how to do something different and they're going oh but I was taught this way and now you're teaching me this and that's different I'm like no it's not different that's where you were then and this is where you are now it like you were saying it's like growth it's it's an add-on it's a development and um yeah so Mm. i feel like i'm more free in my mind not so rigid Mm. is what's happening there a little bit of a a dose of humility i wonder of 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 like in a way putting my mind in 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 a place right in place like i I don't know, you know, the practice of, of not knowing and 
I heard a story about um, a teacher coming to the ashram at one point and asked the question, you know, do you know what's between you and enlightenment? She asked the whole room she was presenting to and uh, maybe people gave different answers and whatnot. She said, no, no, no. It's your opinions. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I hear, you know, you, you saying a lot is, 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 you know, not getting so stuck in my right book. I, it happens to me all the time, right? Like, I think I know what's right. So I have to, in a way, humble my mind, remember that I might think I know, but do I really know? Absolutely. You know, I love uh, Ram Dass and, you know, he keeps talking about how we have to get out of our thinking minds and the way he does it is through saying he is loving awareness. And it's so beautiful and it's so true. We have to get out of these, this thinking mind and this rigidity, this rigidity to the mind. It feels like it calcifies our muscles, our bones, everything. And everything that I'm learning on this path is about how to try and learn to soften. And that's not mm-hmm. easy for me because I'm a very controlling character and a very yeah, rigid, you know, I, when I do posture, I'm thinking about my body and how to align it. And th- this idea of letting go is really difficult for me. But this letting go of rigidity, letting go of the form is so beneficial. Yeah. Wondering what's there that, that is so strong that can keep me holding on to it. And I sense now that it's fear. You know, like I'm afraid to let go of that sense of judgment and, and being right. No, like just, just, just to become that I am loving awareness. To really do that seems that I, I need to release the fear. Mm-hmm. You know? I don't know exactly what I'm afraid of, but I sense that there's fear there. <laughs> I think it comes back to this, you know, conditioning for me anyway. Like if I'm about to react in a in a negative or angry way towards someone, you know, it's like it's this defense to protect yourself. And we're trying to, to be safe. So in a sense, yeah, I suppose fear is, is a possibility. Hmm. Uh, but this rightness is like, for me, it's, it's a big issue um, on, in, in my mind you know, to be right. I so often watch it and I just go, just let go, let go. And then it comes back and I'm like, oh my God, let go. Is this bringing me any benefit? No. And I'm like, but I'm right. No, <laughs> let it go. Huh? That's the but practice. How does that feel for someone else if they've given an idea and you're saying, well, no, I'm right and you're wrong. How does that other person feel? You know, like, how can we be right all the time? Yeah. I think you we've lost it. the skill to, to listen. To listen. Yeah. You hear it all around. It's, you know, it's the way we communicate with, with, with each other. You know, this is my point. It's, it's taking my identity so seriously. You know, it's, that's what I want to give up and, and be free of if I can. It's, it's not taking myself so seriously. Right? And that I can see directly is the fear of, of you know, who Avi is. Mm-hmm. And is, is he valuable? Is he, that's connected to my, my opinions and my judgments. And if I let that go, you know, what does that mean? What's left? <laughs> yeah but it's our nature of, of, of talking to each other like even even in this conversation you know it's it's there you know with our our interpretations of of, of what is right what we feel is right it's like that's what we communicate about all the time it's like what we think is right even if we're talking about letting go of rightness yeah, <laughs> that, that's the greatness about hanging out with Sangha because, you know, often um, you're speaking with like-minded people that think similarly to you. So it sort of like encourages 
our belief system and we're like, yeah, yeah. And it's great when we come out and we're all happy and then we sometimes go home to a family member or a friend who's like the absolute opposite of that. And, you know, like life comes smashing down and you just go, oh, my God, you know. But that's where the real teachings are. I think so too. Like you, you, you reminded me, I was, I was watching a video of Guru Dev the other day and something really clicked for me. He was talking about meditation. He said, when you meditate, that's when you're learning. Like that's when, when you're training, you're getting to know how your mind works and you're, you're figuring out kind of maybe how you want to be, how you want to feel, you know, the exact words that he used, but something along those lines. And then he said, after the meditation, is when you're putting in practice what you've learned during meditation. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. So it's like every every moment is an opportunity to practice. You know, it's a it's a hard one, especially maybe when we're visiting with our family or, like you said, around people who think differently. And the Absolutely. way I do to, to still remember, that's an opportunity to practice something. I had a challenging situation this year and it, I, I was like, it, why am I being presented with this lesson and why am I allowing it to, to get to me so much? And it was because I wanted to be right. And, but I also embraced the fact that, you know, not everyone's meant to, to work together. And not everyone's compatible with each other. And it's okay to be honest about that. You know, sometimes I think when we're on this spiritual path that we're meant to sort of be all peaceful and nice and sort of, and people even think that you're a certain way because, oh, Lucy's a yoga teacher. She's meant to be kind and loving. And I found myself roaring like a lion because I I needed to, to speak my truth. And it was important for me to do that and be honest and authentic and just go, no, this is who I am. And you're not bringing out a nice side of me. And I don't think it's great that we're working together and let's do our best to finish up here, but it's okay. You know, and, and for me, I think the biggest challenge was that I couldn't deal with it well. And I didn't like that about myself. I didn't like the fact that I'd been presented a challenge and I couldn't find a way to to deal with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in a way I'm hearing you say that, that maybe you were like confining yourself, restricting yourself by placing a label of I'm a yogi, you know, and this is yeah. what a yogi is, is peaceful is maybe someone who's able to deal with any situation, you know, and, and now you're like, you know what, maybe this is too much for me. I, I, I could be in this fire or I could move away from it so I don't need to get burned. Yeah, it, it, I always kind of like, I, I, I dance between, you know, what Master Shivananda says, bear insult, bear injury, higher sadhana. And then I'm like, well, that doesn't really make sense all the time because do we need to be burning all the time? Like, and, it, and that's where discriminative discernment comes in. We have to use our common sense of am I practicing, you know, Ahimsa and Satya and all of the yamas and niyamas. Am I am I being truthful to myself? Am I being kind to myself? Am I being kind to this other human being? You know, and <laughs> yeah. So do you feel like you're being kinder to yourself these days than you were in the past? I do. I do. I feel there's a long way to go though. <laughs> <laughs> But as you said, the journey never ends. And all I know is the more that I'm on this path and the more that I listen to and the more that I read, the more I realize I know absolutely nothing. And that's okay. But somewhere along the line, I feel a little bit more peaceful in who I am. I'm not trying to prove to anybody anymore. I remember once I was at, um, in Germany at the Integral Yoga uh, Yoga Reunion, and I was petrified. We used to go to so there's you know all these teachers that come from there's a few guest teachers that come from the states, um, and then you've got all the senior teachers within Europe that come, and and then I was invited to to present, and I had done before, and the, 
in Italy, the first time I presented, I was like a robot. I was like, oh my God, there's all these swamis and teachers in the room that are above me. And like I taught this most mechanical class because I was like, this is what I've been taught. And when I got to Germany, I said to Swami Divyananda, who was coming to the talk, I said, you know what? I really don't care what people think of me. I'm just going to be me and I'm going to say what I want and I'm going to do what I want and we're going to dance and we're going to have fun and um, and that's it. And that was amazing for me just to let go of this idea of how I thought I had to be, which no one was telling me to do, but I was just thinking that, you know, this is what we've been taught. So there was this rigidity again going back to sort of earlier on. And now I'm just like, doesn't matter who's in the room. I'm just going to say what's on my mind. And if someone comes up to me, well, so what? You know, that's where I am right now. Do you feel uh, and that's that very you're... liberating. Right. And do you feel also that that is back to what we spoke about in the beginning in terms of service? Like, is you providing an example of someone who feels free to just simply be me? Mm -hmm. Say what feels right, do what feels right. Does that give other people permission to do that as well? And is it therefore a service? I would say so. You know, when I when I was just teaching in, in Gibraltar a few months ago, you know, they all came up to me at different times and said, Thank you for your honesty. And sometimes I feel that, you know, especially if you're in the role of being a trainer or a teacher, that there's maybe like a different level, like, and I never want that. I want to be as honest as I can possibly be. Um, and I think um, being this authentic and humble version of myself, of just going, this is who I am, this is what my mind is like, allows people to be more authentic and just be who they are. Like, I'm not pretending to be, you know, this perfect yogi I, I don't really know anyone that like like is this sort of like equanimity of mind all the time everybody has an ego everybody is judgmental everyone likes to gossip now and again I haven't met a human being yet that doesn't you know and that's all part of it and it's all fine you know so I think by being an example of that that it does encourage other people to be more authentic in themselves and be okay yeah. I love uh, simple practices, like breaking things down. And what you said, you know, can I be as honest as I can possibly be, like as a goal to be as honest as possible? Like, does it need to get more complicated than that? Yeah. No. That's it. It's good. <laughs> <sighs> Thank you so much, friends. Um, it's been awesome to, you know, I, I say like, I remember when I first met you, one of the cool things about my position is, is getting to know the Sangha around the world. And, um, it's, it's just amazing what the integral yoga family is and the types of people that, that are in it. And, uh, meeting you is definitely like that. Like, oh my gosh, this person is also a part of the family. Like how cool, um, it's always a pleasure to uh, to connect with you, my friend. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you. I'm so grateful for the the opportunity and for for Integral Yoga. It's such an incredible sangha, and all of us are kind of dotted all around the world, but somehow connected through whether it's you know meditating together or practicing or just knowing that we're all there. You know, it, it's so so beautiful. And uh, I'm so grateful for everything that you're doing, Abby, because since you came into the organization, it feels like you've uplifted and kind of modernized uh, the organization in some way. And I'm so grateful that you're sort of like pulling people out of the, the woodwork that maybe wouldn't come out and speak. You know, it's, it's fantastic. All the great speakers that you've had come out and, and that you're being brave enough to do this. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. It is all about the community, though. That's I, I'm realizing more and more like behind people's actions is to feel a sense of belonging all the time, right? And like what a gift it is to be a part of of this family that we're we're a part of. Just there's I've received a lot of benefit by identifying that basic human need to have sangha, have have community. Um, 
it, it feels good because we can just go further together if it's a healthy community. Absolutely. And, you know, I think there's always people within a community that are going to make us rub and scrub a little bit more. And there's, and that's part of any family. But then there's those people that really you feel are your tribe. You know, they're, they're like, they're your brothers and they're your sisters. And you just, you don't even need words, just knowing that they're there for you. And, and I think that's so beautiful because I think that most people within their sort of like family environment or maybe even in their day-to-day environment if they're not sort of like within a a sort of setting which is a bit more sort of peaceful well actually I think wherever you are there's always challenges I I worked at a yoga center for eight years and they became family and that was like um but you know it, it it's just it's beautiful to have um you know the sangha to to connect in with to know that there's other people that are thinking in a in a similar way and really wanting to improve themselves in in some way to make themselves a more whether whether it's peaceful or where but just get to know themselves better. I realize that more and more people when I'm teaching out in the world is I, I teach a lot of yoga classes on a day to day basis and people aren't open to talking about emotions. They just shut everything off. It's like, it's like I've come here to do my Hatha yoga practice. I don't want to talk about my mind. And, and they just, they're not open to really looking into who they are and learning about the nature of their mind. And, and I'm so grateful for all the friends that I've got that are willing to take this journey and, you know, and have conversations about the mind. I think it, it's beautiful. And, and, and our pitfalls I think the most growth can come through sharing each other's, um, I don't even want to call it failures, um, but where we've, hit rock, where, where we've hit rock bottom is where we really start to, you know, rise from the ashes and come up again and, and, and feel that we're cleaner and purer in some sense and, and we've gone through stuff. And, and it's the sangha that really help us to to do that and and the integral yoga sangha is such a a beautiful family and when we come together for these reunions and stuff it's it's so precious and uh and the time that when we were in lockdown you know with with all the um, and and you and i were doing these uh whatever it was it weekly talks we i can't even remember what we were doing but we had uh talks quite often organizing different speakers to come in. And again, it felt like this coming together when needed, this coming together. And it was so beautiful, such a support system. Mm. One thing to mention that you brought up is is like the, these challenges that we go through in our minds and the difficulty, right? And there's so much around mental illness, you know, right now you're mentioning, you know, people don't really, many people don't want to talk about what's happening, you know, in their minds, but what I've been finding again is that it's such a service to be able to be honest, notice what's happening in your own mind, and then express that to someone else. Because what it does, I think, is that's that right there is what creates Sangha. Yeah. It, because so often it's like, wow, you experienced that. I experienced that too. And then we feel less alone. And that's really where the suffering in life happens is, is from a feeling of, of loneliness, you know? Um, and yeah, the, you, another thing I noticed with the mind is that because it feels like it can be like a secret place, <laughs> like no one else knows what's going on in my mind. Right. And because of that, uh, I think we hide. There's like a tendency to like, Oh, I'm, I don't want anyone else to see what's happening in there. Yeah. You know, because it can be secretive. We choose to make it secretive but it doesn't have to be that way. And I think that's the, the getting clean and feeling free is, is by being honest with what's happening there and then expressing fully, it. Fully, you know, uh, so many, when, in my yoga classes, when I, I give a little talk at the beginning and basically about what's going on in my mind. And, and I say, I don't know about, you know, any of you in the room, but you know, does anyone else have this? And, you know, everyone's like nodding and agreeing. And I said, isn't it beautiful? that we all have the same issues and thoughts and we're not alone. You know, and I, 
going back to your your question about you know being honest with people, it it definitely encourages other people to speak up. I think so many people are so so repressed, and they don't know, they think it's wrong. They think it's wrong to express emotions. Of course, it's not good to be expressing all the time and being super over, <laughs> but there's a, there's a, there's a balance, and and I think with our conditioning, there is this repression of talking about how we really are. Yeah, and, and, and again, I, and you taking, taking ourselves so seriously is what causes yes. that suffering of like, you know, I need to prove, I need to be seen as a. It's really sad in a way, but it, it's also exciting uh, to see how much further you know human beings can go if we move beyond this to a place of 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 not taking myself seriously and just being light. Okay, this is the way that I am. I'm just going to be me. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's the power of the practices. I think of yoga. That's really where I, I hope that it's helping me get get to myself. You know. Mm. Yeah, it's a great path. I'm very grateful that mm. this uh, path, uh, well, my mum pulled me onto this path, so I'm very grateful to her um, for digging me out of the stressful world of London and uh, <laughs> putting me onto the path of yoga. Mm. Well, I'm grateful for her too. Yeah. We wouldn't be here right now without her. So, uh, Thank you so much, my friend. Really thank appreciate you. it. It was so great talking with you. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this content and think others might as well, please feel free to share and subscribe.